you are in the strongest position of this district's history. You know, not a lot of 100-year-old institutions, whether it's in the church world or whether it's in the corporate world, can say in their 100th year that they're in their strongest uh, position. But that's a huge testimony to the faithfulness of God over the Illinois district. Hallelujah. I want to talk tonight about the church, just the church, which is really what we are all about, the church. Start by making this observation. It's possible to be committed to the church, but not to Christ. But you cannot be committed to Christ and not the church. I love the church. Every major, eternal, significant event in my life took place in the church. I was dedicated as a baby in the church. I was saved in the church, water baptized in the church, spirit baptized in the church, got my call into the ministry in the church. I'm telling you, this thing called the church really does work. And when you're born again, you know that. You automatically become a part of the worldwide church of God, our global brothers and sisters in Christ. But when you join a church or when you're credentialed by a church, that's voluntary. Now, we've all witnessed that when a church becomes nothing more than just an entertainment business, biblical literacy is an early casualty. <clears throat> I've seen it over the course of time. People can leave a church service with a smile on their face but still have a huge hole in their heart. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So I want to just say up front, I'm all in for the church. I love the church. My life has been impacted by the church. But we're sort of in a unique time in history in the church as we're seeking to sort of recapture our identity. I mean, you think about it. There's a lot of people that want to put corporate labels on the church, right? Are you a mega church? You emerging church? You a purpose driven church? Seeker sensitive church? Classical Pentecostal church? Community minded church? Evangelical church? Can I just tell you, the church was never intended to be a business with a cross on its roof, tweaked by a bunch of engineers. We are the body of Christ. We're, we're, we're the instrument that He's using to expand His kingdom here on earth. The church. Corporate labels. You have some people that try to uh, level us with a lot of critical comments. Um, church is the only place that shoots its wounded. Uh, the church fails to meet my needs. The church is full of hypocrites. The church is too shallow. The church isn't relevant enough. And then, of course, there's various expectations. How many of you have experienced other people's expectations about how you should lead your church? should take a stand on certain issues. Don't touch that. No business being involved in politics. Get more involved in that. The church needs more doctor. The church needs more practical. It's crazy, right? All these corporate labels, critical comments, various expectations. Here's what Jesus said about his church in Matthew 16. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Amen. Come on, say those five words with me. I will build my church. Come on, say it again. I will build my church. I love it. The church was Christ's idea. He made it. And he made it very clear from the beginning that this was his project. He's the architect. He's the originator. He protects it. He designs it. He leads it. We're not the key to its success. We can mess it up. But it's his idea. Second thing about the church is that, well, Christ has sole authority and ownership of the church. Your church isn't your church. This district isn't your district. This denomination isn't my denomination. The fact of the matter is Christ is the head of the church. And I think ultimately the church will survive. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. God has always had a people. The church has always overcome odds. So I love the church. You do too. But what's been the key? What's the key to 100 years of a district's effectiveness? What's the key to effectiveness of a local church? And that's what I want to talk about. 
four keys tonight of thriving churches, districts, networks that get better with age rather than get archaic with age. It's going to be pretty simple. The four things I want to talk about are the Bible, the Spirit, reaching people, and the next generation. Let's start with the Bible. The Bible. Illinois has been and currently is a missionally fruitful district because your leadership places a high priority on biblical teaching and that always trumps political rhetoric. That would be a great place to say amen or ouch. I pray that Assemblies of God churches here and around the world will always be known for placing a higher priority on biblical teaching than, prophetic or than political uh, rhetoric. You say, why is that? Well, very simple. Come on, all of you have prepared yourself for credentials. We know that the Bible is God's idea. It's his truth. The Bible is God's perfect revelation, right? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking. We get that. We know that the Bible is God's complete or sufficient revelation to us. Jude 3, dear friends, as I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compared to write and urge you watch this to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. God is not delivering any new canonical information to his people. Everything that you need to know about heaven, about hell, about God, about purpose and life can be found in the word of God. It's a perfect revelation. It's a complete revelation. But the cool thing about God's word is it's his living revelation. It's alive. The writer of Hebrews says the word of God is alive. It's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and morals. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Here's my contention tonight. The Bible, when used correctly, is incredibly transformational. But when the Bible is used incorrectly, it can be horribly dangerous. So what gives the church such missional fruitfulness over the course of decades it's staying committed to the word it's staying committed to the word i suspect i discovered the power of how god's word can be used inaccurately but then corrected in my own life shared a little bit this morning preacher's kid born and raised in this thing cut my teeth in the back of church pews uh, but when my dad died uh, i was nine years old and the youth pastor at the time, Bill Leach, 21 years old, was elected to be the pastor. Brother and Sister Leach didn't have any children at that time. And so it's like my, like my dad, practically and spiritually my father. One of the fun things I used to like to do with the Leaches was that on Sunday nights, when there was a guest speaker, we'd go out to eat with them. And I could always tell the status of the speaker by where we went out to eat after Sunday night. It's really cool. So if it was one of his buddies from school, we'd always go back to the house. Sister Leach would make sandwiches, and they'd play games and talk smack. If it was somebody visiting that they didn't know, we would go to Pizza Bucket because they had a buffet, and it was usually quick, and you didn't have to socialize. But if it was a big shooter, if it was a big speaker, no one arrived, we'd go to Frisch's Big Boy because that was the only all-full-service amenity restaurant open in Adrian, Michigan on Sunday nights. Well, I'll never forget, it was, it was just about a year after my dad died and Brother Leach was the pastor. And uh, there was a high-profile evangelist that came and held services. If I said his name, several of you in the room would know who it is. He had his worship team, he had his product booth people, and uh, just uh, kind of preached what I would call an extra prosperity type message. You know what I'm talking about that. And so, hi, uh, just, just kind of, yeah, just there. Well, I'll never forget, we went out to Big Boy. We went to Big Boy, and I'm 10 years old, and I'm doodling on my place, mat. and all of a sudden, I hear this evangelist say to Pastor Leach, you know, Reverend, that the reason why your predecessor died at such an early age, there was either sin in his life or it was a lack of his wife's faith. And I remember looking over, and like only a wise, healthy pastor could do. Brother Leach quickly changed the subject, brought that meal to a close, and as we were walking out, he said, Duggar, I want you to ride with me. 
He had a 1978 Chevy Impala. I remember it. It had a bucket seats and had that armrest that came up. He said, I want you to sit on that armrest. Bucket seat belts weren't a big deal back then. And <laughs> just saying. So I sat on that armrest and he threw his arm around me. He said, I know you heard something tonight at the table, but I want you to know that what you heard was not true. And he began to unpack scriptures for me about heaven, about hell, about a life, about our life and times are in the Lord's hands. And for about 12 minutes, he rightly divided the word of truth regarding some inaccurate way in which somebody was using the Bible and kept it from impacting my life. Bible. I said it this morning. God didn't give us the Bible to make us smarter sinners. He gave us the word of God to change our lives, to guide our lives, to transform our lives. And way too many churches have lost their prophetic relevance because they've opted for political speech. The Bible. The Bible. It's God's revelation to us and it still works. Thank you, Illinois. Thank you, Pastor, for continuing to place a high priority on Scripture. I would submit to you that the Illinois district has, has been and currently is missionally fruitful because this district believes that the Holy Spirit is a person to be experienced, not an it to be debated. Now, come on. As... <laughs> As a kid growing up in a Pentecostal church, I saw a lot of things done in the name of the Holy Spirit that were quite interesting. As a grown kid, as the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, I've seen the Holy Spirit get blamed for a lot of things that I don't think he really initiated. <laughs> Dr. Wood used to keep a file of all the crazy stuff that uh, would come. I found that file. It has, his label on it was Pathetic Prophecies. And he would record, when the EPs would come to town and share these stories, he would record, this one was just hilarious. It happened in Houston. A pastor, a pastor had been preaching about the ills of Santa Claus. His sermon was Scrooge, Santa Claus or Savior, who will you celebrate this Christmas? And this pastor was just laying out Santa. He was just reeling on him and talking about the secularization and all that. And he got to the end of his message and he bowed his head. And about that time, a little lady in the back of the church stood up. She said, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Lay off Santa Claus. He's a good man doing a good work. <laughs> So, come on, I, we've all seen some of the stuff that the Holy Spirit gets attributed to. As we talked about today, he really is the third member of the Godhead who resides in our life and is important for ministry. I could unpack this a lot, but I, can I just give you a couple reasons why I think we need a fresh, ongoing, active relationship with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the first one is this. The Holy Spirit protects you from yourself and the wrong thinking that the enemy tries to trick you with. I'm serious. Paul said in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. Would you say those two words? No condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, watch this, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of death. You know, that's not just a good verse for people who get saved and keep getting tripped up by the things that they've been forgiven for. That's a ver great verse to claim when the enemy comes along and on the Sunday on the drive home, you question yourself, am I the right hand and glove fit for this church? Or you don't feel like your message was really connecting or you don't feel like you're, you're in the right spot. Listen, Paul went on to say in verse 5, Romans 8, those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are 
controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that please the Spirit. I think sometimes in, in ministry, if we're not careful, the enemy plays head games with us. Causes us to compare ourselves. Causes us to think we're, we're, we're not where we should be and all of that. And I just want to encourage you, keep an active relationship alive. Keep a, uh, with the Holy Spirit because he can protect you from you. And the wrong thinking that the enemy tries to trick us with. I think the other thing the Holy Spirit does is he initiates the miraculous in our life by always being right on time. Aren't you thankful that God is an on-time God and that the Holy Spirit can initiate the miraculous in our life by, by being right on time? Here's what I've discovered. The Holy Spirit is not the idle spectator of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is very active in bringing the presence of Jesus into our ministries. Bringing the presence of Jesus into our ministries. Presence, it's a big deal. Um, any grandparents, if you're a grandparent, would you just raise your hand? Isn't grandparenting wonderful? I <laughs> love it. My wife and I have seven grandchildren, ages 10 to 3, and here's what I've discovered. The reason why grandparents and grandkids get along so well, <laughs> we've got the same common enemy, their parents. <laughs> your laughter is like a loud amen to me right now. So Jackson is our oldest grandson, and about three years ago, he and I decided it would be okay for him to have an overnighter at Papa's house without his parents. Now, it took a lot of convincing his mom, my firstborn, that we could do this, but we tag-teamed up, and uh, we sort of be, I mean, convinced her into submission that this would be okay. I'll never forget, she said, okay, so it was a Friday night. I went over to the house. When I pulled in to pick up Jackson, he was standing in the doorway. He had his Spider-Man backpack there with all of his jammies and his Paw Patrol DVDs. And when I pulled into the driveway, he said, Papa, Papa, I said, Jackson, you ready to come to Papa's house? He said, yes, I am. And so I grabbed his hand, we turned and started to walk away, and then his mom, <laughs> my firstborn, <clears throat> cleared her throat and said, Dad, Dad, Dad. I said, yeah. And she handed me a three-by-five card. <laughs> and on that card was a set of six very specific instructions. I started reading these instructions. I got down to instruction number three, Dad, comma, after 6 p.m., please make sure you put two parts water, one part apple juice in his sippy cup. Well, I thought, first of all, we don't do mixed drinks at Papa's house. We are 100% Dr. Pepper at Papa's house. Come on, I ain't away. Two parts water. <laughs> yeah, okay, babe. We got in the truck. I tore that sucker up. I said, come on, Jackson. We're going to have fun. And we did. We did. We played hide-and-go-seek. We played wiffle ball. We watched Paw Patrol cartoons. He got his bath and his jammies on. It was wonderful. I didn't need a set of six very specific instructions. About the time that uh, Jackson was to retire, a southwest Missouri storm whipped up. I mean, a doozy of a storm. Loud thunder, crackling lightning. And I could tell he was a little anxious. I said, little buddy, you want to sleep in Papa's room? He said, yeah, yeah. So I made him a sleeping area on my side of the bed, some blankets, a pillow. I said, now, just, just lay down, little buddy. He'd lay down. Boom, a crack of thunder. He'd jump up. I said, you're okay, little buddy. Lay down. Lightning would flash. He would pop up. This happened about four times. Finally, after he popped up four times, I, I said something. Now, I don't know where it came. I don't know whoever programmed in this to me. What I said to him makes no meteorological sense, and it certainly makes no theological sense, but he popped up. I said, little buddy, you don't have to be afraid of thunder. You see, thunder is nothing more than just God moving his furniture up in heaven. <laughs> don't judge me, Grandma. Don't judge me. You would have put Robitussin in that sippy cup, so don't judge me. I got your number, baby. He went, oh, okay, and he laid back down. 
next crack of thunder, he didn't jump up. I'm like, cool, I'll let his kids pastor work out his theology. I just want him to fall asleep. So he's laying there, and I roll over. I'm thinking everything is good. And all of a sudden, a loud, a loud reverberating thunder hit. And come on, grandparents, you know we've got an extra sense. I could just feel a set of eyes looking at me. I could... And I turned around, and sure enough, he wasn't standing all the way up. He was just looking over the mattress, just looking over. The... But boy, his eyes were huge. And I rolled over, and before I could say anything, he said, Papa, do you think I could lay with you till God quits moving his furniture? <laughs> I said, you bet, little buddy. So I picked him up, and I plopped him down in bed, and within 30 seconds, he was out. You know, I couldn't convince that little tyke that the storm on the outside wouldn't hurt him on the inside. But as long as he was in close proximity to Papa, he had a sense of security to rest comfortably to be able to fall asleep. Come on, sometimes you have to know that the Lord, the presence of the Lord is right there, right with you. Sometimes you just need to bring yourself into close proximity to Papa. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. He'll keep you in the presence of the Lord. He'll keep reminding you that those issues that keep be, being brought up at your church won't harm you. Holy Spirit. He's not an it to be debated. He's not a ghost to be feared. He's the third member of the Godhead that when we accept Christ, he comes into our life and we say yes to ministry. He fuels our ministry passions and he gives us endurance. Thank you, Illinois District and Illinois credentialed ministers for being a Pentecostal, spirit-empowered, believing in the third person of the Holy Spirit type network. I so appreciate that. I think the third thing that has made the Illinois district so successful over these 100 years is your missions participation. This is a missions participation district. I saw the lunch today where the missionaries were in there. I had a chance tonight at dinner to set with a couple different missionaries and uh, I would just say more than embedded into the ethos of this district, embedded into the ethos of the assemblies of God is this desire to reach people for Jesus, not just here in Illinois, but around the world. You see, the motivation to do missions is not out of some guilt or denominational obligation. It's a firm conviction that God, Christ died for everyone, and everyone has a right to taste and see that the Lord is good. And just because the gospel has gone to every political country in the world doesn't mean that every people group in the world has been reached. Can I just explain that for a few moments for several of our missionary friends in the audience? There are 7,000 unreached people groups in the world. And an unreached people group is a community of people with less than 2% Christian. Now listen to this. Over 42% of the world's population live in one of those 7,000 unreached people groups. You know what that tells me? People everywhere need Jesus. We participate in reaching people for Jesus because he meets their need because that's, that's why God set us apart. That's the ethos. That's the blessing. That's the nerve center of the blessing of the assemblies of God that we believe all the gospel for all the world. I discovered this in living color, uh, really, my first six months in pastoring in Toledo, Ohio. I had the privilege of pastoring um, the church in Toledo, Ohio. It was a it was a church that when I went there, when I got there, it's a church that experienced a lot of um, successful tragedies in terms of the way in which pastors left. <laughs> the pastor before me, one Thursday night, got in a fight with his board, and on Sunday morning, he and five of the full-time staff members announced their resignation, walked down the center aisle, jumped in a red and suburban, and went across town and started a new church. The pastor before that, seven years into his ministry, was living, discovered he was living a gay lifestyle. 
and the pastor before that had mismanaged funds to the tune of $4.5 million in a building project. So I come on the scene, fresh out of youth ministries. I thought, well, I'm not going to do anything you haven't seen. And uh, I have a few Carmen Human videos in my bag of tricks to build this church. Lazarus, Jesus, Lazarus, Jesus. It's a historic church in Ohio. They were district supervised, $4 million in debt. I come into Dodge and, man, let's go. Let's build this church. It was a wonderful ride. Six months into pastoring, and, and I know what it's like to hold bills and notice the due date. I know what it's like to send memo to staff and say, hey, hold on depositing that till we can get Sunday's offering deposited. And we're in a board meeting, and one of our board members feels that we should respond to a missions challenge to the tune of $50,000 by the end of the year. This was a September board meeting. <laughs> oh man, I didn't want to look like one, I don't believe in missions, and no, I don't believe in faith, but I'm going, man, we're, we're, we're juggling bills, we're, we're working on cash flow, we're trying to meet, and, and, uh, and, and I said, what do you guys think? <laughs> and some on the board, you know, pastor, you can never outgive God, and we should probably respond to others. Hey, we have a fiduciary responsibility. And, and so I asked one of the board members, I said, Dan, why don't you just lead us in prayer? So he started to pray, God, give us wisdom, help us to know. And all the while he's praying, I'm going, you know, we could make a $10,000 commitment by the end of the year. I could take up a couple love offerings and all that. And he says, Lord, I know you're going to help our pastor know exactly what to do and how to respond in this moment. I said, amen. He said, well, what should we do? <laughs> I said, what do you think we should do? He said, pastor, I think we ought to respond appropriately. And he said, I think we ought to do our best to pay that off, not only by the end of the year, but as quickly as possible. As a testament to our faith that God... Well, now he's talking like a preacher. He's talking like Mike McNamee, the evangelist missionary, you know. And I'm just like, wow. And everybody had just kind of caught momentum. Well, I didn't want to be the one with the lack of faith. I said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. So I communicated to the district missions director. I communicated, hey, we're all in 50 grand by the end of the year. But I got worried. How are we going to do this? What are we going to cut? How are we going to find this? And lo and behold, you should know this because we learned these stories. The following Monday, that was a board meeting on Thursday. The following Monday, um, the finance director of the church, her name was Brenda Kennedy. I was still new and still trying to develop things. She came in. She said, now, Pastor Clay, she said, I know you're new, and I don't want you to be drinking out of fire hose, but these are the terms of our note for our loan. And uh, by the way, our note's coming due. If you're in favor of this, one of the things we could do, we could go to a balloon payment, we could renegotiate this. And, and she said, you know, the savings would be about $50,000 between now and the end of the year if we were to do this. I smiled. I said, Brenda, that sounds like a great idea. I gave her the props for that. And sat back in my chair and thought, it's true. A, you can never outgive God. And when you give to the things that are a priority to the Lord, he will take care of you. So when you get a pledge card and a little paraphernalia from some of our missionaries, be it the Bucks or the Keatings or the Maddoxes, it's not denominational obligation that we participate in missions. It's just a deep, deep commitment that we believe everybody has the right to taste and see that the Lord is good. Right. And over the course of 100 years, you can trace this yourself. The hand of God, the blessing of God, the canopy of God's blessing is on those who invest in the things that God invests in. You know, it was a, uh, Oswald J. Smith that said, the church that doesn't evangelize will fossilize. Missions. Finally, 
I think the Illinois district has enjoyed a hundred years of ministry fruitfulness because you are a district that has been and currently is a district that believes every generation has a right to experience the presence of God. Every generation has a right to experience their own Pentecost. Can I just walk into your space a little bit and talk with you? You know, it's possible, particularly pre-COVID, that there were so many activities in the church that it distracted us from the one essential ingredient that makes the church a unique place in society. Worship. Worship. Corporate worship. Gordon Dahl says it this way, most Americans tend to worship their work and to work at their play and to play at their worship. And as a result, their meetings, their values get distorted, their relationships disintegrate faster than they can keep them in repair. And I just want to challenge you. This, um, this concept of Pentecostal worship, spirit-empowered worship... A type of worship where you can feel the presence of God is huge. Because one of the unique things about the church is that every week you give people a break from looking at life horizontally and you give them an opportunity to look at life vertically. You know, when you just look at life, when you do life from a horizontal standpoint, it's energy draining, it's cutthroat, it's rough, it's, it's nasty, it's all of that. But when you come into a church service and, to, and encourage people to turn their eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face and to sing about the greatness and the goodness of God, it's powerful. And I would particularly say it's important for the next generation to understand the difference between worship and Christian music. Both are good. But worship, worship, we're, we're encouraged. I mean, Psalm 150 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, praise God in a sanctuary. Psalm 149 verse 1, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, praise Him in the assembly of His faithful. Why is it important to regularly set aside time, not to just sing Christian songs, but to worship God Almighty. Why? Number one, so we don't forget who he is and all he's done. I don't ever want to get to the place where I forget. I, I, Psalm 150 verse 2 says, Praise him for his acts of power. And praise him for his surpassing greatness. We worship the Lord because we don't want to forget the power of his word. Look how much comes ties back to the word of God. Psalm 106 says, They despised the pleasant land. They didn't believe his promise. They grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. Now this is a generation of people that saw a miracle happen every single day. They were fed supernaturally every day. You know what that tells me? Miracles don't produce spiritual maturity. In fact, when you are void of biblical worship, you are susceptible to grumbling in their tents and didn't obey the Lord. Now watch this. Not only did they grumble, so he swore to them with uplifted hand that he would make them fall in the wilderness, make their descendants fall among the nations and scatter them throughout the lands. They yoked themselves to the God or the Baal of Peor, which was the God, the philosophy of that day, and they ate sacrifices to lifeless gods. Maybe one of the reasons why some of the younger generation are trying to deconstruct their faith is they don't know the difference between singing Christian songs and worshiping the greatness and the power of our God. Because when you're void of worship, that can lead to grumbling, and grumbling can lead to you yoking yourself with the ideologies of that day. So I want to encourage you. The package of worship, the order of service, isn't just to throw a, a few cool little Maverick City or Elevation songs and to think it through on how you're leading your people to experience the character and the dimension and the greatness of God. It's important. For the next generation. I think the third thing that's the reason why we ought to keep Pentecostal worship alive in our church services 
is that so we can learn to sing a little louder in the middle of our mystery. Just so that we can learn to sing a little louder in the, in the middle of our mystery. Obviously, I'm quoting from that song, I Raise a Hallelujah. Uh, that became pretty significant to me a year ago in April. So a year ago in February, uh, I, I suffered a stroke. I had a stroke of the medulla. Kind of came out of nowhere. I was watching the Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday. I, I, I got up to use the restroom, and the whole right side of my body just went numb. I, I couldn't use it. I couldn't walk. I thought, okay, this feels something. Well, a few hours later, I'm in the emergency room, and sure enough, they do a stroke right up. And some plaque had broken away from an artery and found itself at the base of my brain. I thank the Lord I didn't have any speech or occupational consequences, but my balance was pretty messed up. It took a while for that feeling to come back, and I had to go through some physical therapy and try to regain my balance and really give credit to the Lord and to praying people and the greatness of God. And, and so it was about a six-week ordeal. And my first ministry assignment was in southern Idaho. I was going to do their district council, speak their ordination. They were electing a new district superintendent at that time, and so it was a big deal. And It was my first time to speak. I didn't let a lot of people know, but I wasn't feeling too sure in my balance. Every now and then I'd feel like I'd catch myself and... And yet I didn't, want to, I didn't want to miss this district council. I didn't want to miss the ordination. I wanted to be there. And I'll never forget, I was driving to the airport, and, and I was, uh, the enemy just kind of got into my head. You sure you're ready for this? <laughs> what if you trip? You know, you talk about vanity. What if, what if you trip going up the steps? Or what if you lose your balance when you're speaking? And all of a sudden, I started playing out these terrible what-if scenarios. And I got scared. And... On my radio, uh, Sirius XFM 63, that song, Raise a Hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Raise a hallelujah in the middle of a mystery. I'm going to sing in the middle. And I'd heard that, and I, wow, I like that song. So I cranked it up, and I just started doing what that song said. Sing a little louder. <laughs> sing a little louder. And... Each time it, I started singing a little louder. <laughs> when I got to the light, kind of before the airport, there was people were looking at me, and I didn't care at that point. By the time I parked my truck, at the, I was singing a little louder. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. I don't know if your theology lets you accept that. But as I began to sing a little louder in the middle of my mystery, I became less fearful and more faith-filled. And we have a generation of young people that we need to come alongside of them and sing a little louder with them. Sing a little louder about the goodness of God. Sing a little louder about God's plan for human sexuality. Sing a little louder that God has their future in his, in his best interest. So we don't keep worship alive as some sort of denominational obligation. We keep worship alive so that we can help the next generation have their Pentecost. David said in Psalm 72, Lord, don't forsake me when I'm old and gray till I declare your power to the next generation. We owe it to the next generation to help them experience their Pentecost. And thank you, thank you, Illinois, for always placing a high priority at kid ministry, youth ministry, young adult ministry. The church, the church, oh, I love it. Even with all of our weaknesses and our flaws, can I just tell you, the local church is a great place to gather. I mean, you think about it. It's a great place to raise your family. It's a great place to get some good life counseling that's biblically centered. 
It's a great place for your kids to see godly examples. It's a great place for adults to make friends and, and journey in life together. It's a great place where our worship can get collected and be off in heavenward. It's a great place to have our hunger for God satisfied. It's a great place to invest your resources knowing that they're going to be stewarded for kingdom purposes. It's a great place for hurting people to find love, acceptance, forgiveness. It's a great place to find a hug of affirmation, a warm smile, maybe even a tear of understanding. I'm telling you, the church is a great place. You won't find those things at the Outlet Mall, at Planet Fitness, or at Starbucks. You'll only find them in the church. So the church, we're essential. And I get it, we're in the 21st century. But I can promise you, in 21st century context, the Bible still works. The Holy Spirit still works. Missions still works. And life-giving Pentecostal worship still works. Hey, I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. And um, while they're coming here, can we turn house lights up just a little bit? But if you can't do dim and all that, no problem. Yeah, that's cool. So if you're here and you are 30 years of age or younger, would you stand to your feet? Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. S stay standing. Stay standing, if you will. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for saying yes to the call of God. Thank you for preparing yourself. Thank you for investing. Many of you do invest in the next generation. You're modeling for them what it means to be a Christ follower, what it means to have a set of values based on truth, on scripture. I just want to say thank you. And I want you to know you're not the church of tomorrow. You're very much the church of today. This fellowship needs you. We value you. We want you. And I wanted my ending of my message tonight for you to be the focus of that. So here's what we're going to do. If you're comfortable, and I don't want anybody to be uncomfortable, you can start kind of playing and go, we're going to do Raise a Hallelujah, all right? So I'm just going to tell you straight up, we're going to do that song. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward. It's, a, it's sort of a, a public declaration to your friends that you're all in. You're solid. You're all in on the call of God. You're all in on reaching the next generation. You're all in on Pentecost. You're all in. And then when you get up here and we start worshiping, I'm going to ask those in the audience who are 65 years young and older that you come around this generation, throw your arms around them, and start singing a little louder with them. Now, I know some of you may not know the words. We'll put them up here. That's okay. And even if you don't, just mumble them through. Let them hear you go, no, 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 you know, that's okay. But I'm just telling you, I, I think it's so important that from generation to generation to generation, we don't forget about the greatness of our God, His surpassing greatness, His mighty works, and I'm, you're going to influence my grandkids. I'm not interested in Disney and Paw Patrol influencing my grandkids. I'm interested in you kid workers and next gen workers influencing my grandkids. So I want them to be influenced by a generation of servants know the Lord. So if you're comfortable, well, let's all stand so it doesn't look weird, but if I'll stand, but those of you that 30 and under, if you're comfortable, would you just come and kind of line up right here? This altar calls for you. It's not going to be long. I'm not going to be weird about it, but it's for you. You're going to be the, and why don't you turn and sort of face me? Hey, isn't this a cool, I, I was thinking, you know, under 40, under, this is under 30. You guys rock. This is so cool. You can extend all the way around. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, we're just going to start singing this song, I Raise a Hallelujah in the Presence of My Enemies. And, and as we begin to sing that, if you happen to be 65 or older, I want you to work your way up here. 
And I'm serious. I, I want I want everybody to have somebody with their arm around them. You got a cane and can't get through, just whack them. Just whack them in the knee and get yourself through here. And and uh, you'll, you'll feel some people trying to get their way through. I want this generation to have a hand on their shoulder. Yeah, go ahead and start coming now. And I want them just to feel that we believe in them. We want them. We love them. We need them. So come on, let's lift up this song of worship alone. I raise a hallelujah. 